We welcome friends to this second day of our three-day event here for the meditation workshop in Rice Lake, Wisconsin. Once again, I welcome you all to this morning session. Yesterday, in the two sessions we had, I explained to you the importance of step number one, number two, and number three. Step number one, that you must first locate yourself at the center of your head, at the third eye center, before you start meditation, to make meditation effective. If you haven't done that, it's just a ritual then, and not true meditation. Once you have established yourself there and feel that this body of yours is just around you, it's not you, it's around you, and you are on the top of this body, sitting inside, then with that form of yours, which is sitting inside, start meditation. Not with the body, but with the inner self that sits inside this body. That self also is very similar to this one, so it's not difficult to do it. So you, by practice, you'll be able to make it very easy. Every time you just sit and close your eyes, you'll be there. It's just a matter of practice. The second step I said, since the mind is constantly thinking of outside things and is the biggest distraction to our meditation, try to control the mind to the extent you can by repetition of words given to you by your master. Very often masters give words which do not have much significance outside, but they have significance inside. These mantras and simrans and that are given to us, they do not connect us with outside things. Otherwise, one could be using a simple word that you like. For example, I wanted to one day practice a good, good two-word simran. I said, I'll keep on repeating and control the mind. What were the two words? Shaky's pizza. <laughs> I kept on repeating. Yes, attention would never go in. I remember all the places where I went to for Shaky's pizza outside. So that is why these words that are given to us are very often unrelated to anything outside, but they are related to something inside. And therefore, they are carefully chosen. These mantras are carefully chosen to draw our attention inside. You can repeat any words. If you keep on repeating, the mind cannot think of other words. But if the words you repeat themselves have a connection outside, they are not effective. That is why they repeat the words which masters have chosen for you. And they are beneficial in controlling the mind. And you should use this system of repetition of words, or what you call repetition of mantra, or doing simran, as long as you can. The recommended time for beginners for doing simran is about two hours. So, two hours a day, if possible, early morning. If it's not possible, you can break it up into more than one session. Say one hour in the morning, one hour at night, or an hour and a half in the morning, half an hour at night. If you are free in the afternoon, you can take some session in the afternoon. But with Simran, if you practice continuously, you are practicing the Simran with the mind, not with the tongue. It's not a spoken thing that you're speaking with your tongue. But if you speak with your tongue, it has no value. The mind is still roaming around. The purpose of controlling the mind by making the mind do something only happens if you do Simran with the mind. And that means the thoughts that you have, convert the thoughts to the words of Simran, not add something to the thoughts by speaking from the tongue. So that is why people do a lot of chanting and so on. It doesn't take their attention inside. The chanting is done with the tongue. So the, if you want to do chanting, yes, you chanting with the mind. So this is important as a very important second step to gain access to what is inside us. The third thing I mentioned yesterday was that once you practice meditation by repeating mantra, you will be able to hear sounds inside your head. They are natural sounds. They are coming from various areas. Some are physical, 
some are ester, some are causal, some come from even higher and they represent the highest form of our consciousness. There are several sounds coming and you play with them. Like you pick up sound, different sounds coming, you can pick up one then the other and play with them till you find the most melodious sound out of them. Whichever pulls you with melody, attracts you more, pick up that. Not the gross sounds, which are just sounds maybe loud enough, but not pulling you at all, not attracting you at all. So when you pick up the sound, pick up the one that is most attractive. Now these are, this is the third step to listen to the sound. If you do meditation by Simran regularly, enough time, Simran can be done even when you are not doing meditation. It can be done while you are walking, it can be done, you are doing things where you don't need your intellectual or your intelligence to be applied to something you are doing. You can keep on doing similar. You are doing cooking, during cooking you can do similar. Similar can be done at any time. If you practice similar at all possible times that you can, it becomes a habit of the mind. Mind picks up habits very quickly if you just keep on repeating something. So you can make Simran a habit of the mind. In which case, you will find the mind repeats a Simran even when you're not doing it. When you're not even trying to do it. And that way, you can anytime pause to see what's happening. Instead of thoughts, Simran is going on in your head. And you are sleeping at night. In the middle of the night, you wake up, Simran is going on. Once great master was asked, my master was asked by a disciple, Master, how much meditation do you recommend in every 24 hours? Because we are told two and a half hours is minimum, we can't even do two and a half hours. Great master said, if you do two and a half hours, then you are doing 22 and a half hours other things. So that's uh, very unbalanced. Two and a half hours to spirituality, it, any 22 and a half hours to other activities, you are all involved in other activities. Two and a half hours is not enough. He said, Master, what is your recommendation? How much should we do? He said, my recommendation is do 23 and a half hours if you can. If not 23, at least 22 and a half hours. Master, how can one do it? One has to work, one has to eat food, one has to sleep at night. How can we do that? He says, meditation is not merely doing something to sit down somewhere, close your eyes and do it. Meditation is remembering your master. Meditation is remembering the spiritual, spiritual side of yourself inside, which you can do all the time. So therefore, he said, if you practice Imran, it becomes automatic. That also becomes automatic for more than 22 hours. And therefore, you can, when you think of master all the time, that also becomes meditation. You meditate on the memory of the master who you saw. You meditate on the daily experiences you are having, where you say, this could not have happened but for master's grace. And this will happen for initiates again and again in their life. Every initiate that I have spoken to has had these miracles happening of the initiation in daily life, outside life. And that is why when we thank Master and remember. So, so many incidents happen where we can remember the Master and we can make our similar automatic. Therefore, we can do that kind of meditation to be really leading a spiritual life. Otherwise, it's a small part-time game and we are ready, okay, we'll do a little bit this, this uh, life, then more we'll do next life, more the third life will come for it. Maybe we'll complete our course in the fourth life. Sri Vyal Singh Swamiji of Agra, who set up this Radha Swami faith. He said, we need four lives for this course. I'll tell you his exact phrase which is quoted by him and translate it for you. Ek janam gur bhakti, janam dusre naam, janam tisre turiya par chokhe me nijdham. He says the first one whole life can be spent in devotion to your master. And then get initiated by, the, by a perfect master in your next life. 
third life you can reach the top of the causal plane. Only in the fourth life you can reach your true life, true home. So when you hear these things, that they think it's a long process. It's not a short process. People get impatient. Somebody came to me, he said, I want radiant form ASAP. <laughs> I said, then, ASAP? Yeah, you can get ASAP. After you spent four lives. <laughs> After four lives, it will be ASAP. There is a preparation. We go through a preparation. This is a long phase because we have been trapped here for so long to go back to our true home after millions of years in a journey outside of our true home. There are so many small, small steps that come. Even obstacles come. Because we are trying to go through a phase of this physical world which is controlled by a negative force. There are two forces created by the Creator, the positive force and the negative force. The negative force pervades the physical experience, pervades the astral experience, pervades the causal experience. Imagine these three grand regions of experience in meditation are all controlled by a negative power. What is that negative power? We call it Kaal, which means time. Time is trapping us in this. If there was no time, you'd be at home. Time is a prison. And the prison runs through these three courses. We are right now, when we say four lives, two hours, three hours, what are we talking about? Time. It's time that's creating the whole problem. Time runs everything in, the, in these three universes. And that is why time is a very big trap. And we call it Kaal. Some people have not understood that Kaal literally means time. So they thought it was some negative devil or somebody sitting somewhere. No, there are devils sitting, but many devils are sitting in ourselves. In fact, a little devil is in each one of us. <laughs> and we call it our mind. Our mind is a little devil. And both soul and mind are sitting together. So the positive and negative are sitting in each one of us. And they are also sitting all around creation. So when we are passing through these negative territories run by negative entities, there is a great pressure of negativity to stop us from going home. And that is why a lot of obstacles come on the way to our true home. And these obstacles are created by the negativity around us, negative within us, most importantly our own mind. Our own mind is distracting us more than anything else. So that is why time is taken to go out of this system. And that time is the prison. We are trying to find a way out of time in time. So that is why it takes so long sometimes and people get impatient. You have to have patience if you want to find results. Don't give up. Don't give up. I tried so long it didn't work. Well, it was not supposed to work at that time till you learn certain lessons. So we learn many lessons during our spiritual growth and those lessons include the fact that you can have experiences of up and down in meditation just like you have experience of up and down in life. This physical world in which we are coming as human being is a world of up and down. It's a world of high and low. We all go through it. We all have good times and bad times. I have never met a person anywhere in my life who had only good time all his life, not anyone who never had a bad time. Therefore, it's a combination of the two. Why is that? Because the setup here is that there are nice places in this creation we call heavens. If you are doing all good things and your karma is very high, you go to heaven and spend a lot of time there. If you do all bad things in other places called hell, you go to hell and spend time there. Both these exist in the astral plane. A very large number of heavens and large number of hells is not one only. There are lots of them. Now you can actually experience them in meditation. I go and see them, visit them, but don't stay there too long. Not invisible. 
I remember we had a disciple of great master. One of the three ladies we used to call BBs. Those three ladies used to attend on the great master's daily deeds and one was tall, stout, strong. She controlled everything by her personality. So the other two were subservient to her. She controlled great master's house, great master's wardrobe, great master's daily living and she stayed there with great master. Right to the end, till great master's end of his life, she was there. The second one was tall but lean and she was the next in command and she used to help and she, because she could not get that close to great master, she was entrusted with the kitchen of the great master and made food for him. She was very happy to do the same of cooking food for the great master. But when she would bring what they call thali or a platter of food to the great master's place, the tall lady would be waiting there. Your territory ends here, now I take it in. I remember these things about uh, uh, the local drama within the era of the great master. There was a third one who was short and not so assertive like these two and she was doing meditation more than the others but she had a higher accent, ascended to the higher planes but she could not find either place in great master's house nor find a place in the kitchen so she was made in charge of running the general kitchen for the people, which they called langar. So she would work in the langar, making chapatis, spread by hand, they used to make it by hand. And, but she did so much meditation. Her house was, little, little hut was given to her. <clears throat> I and my family also had a little house next to her hut. So we were very close to her and saw her life and how she was leading her life and very, great woman and she one day was crying loudly in her little room. We came out and we tried to open the door, it wouldn't open, other people were called in, we broke open the door. You see maybe she is in great panic, she was crying, she couldn't stop crying, like she was screaming and we said, baby what happened, what's happened? She wouldn't speak, just kept her crying. So we rushed to great master house and said, the baby is crying. He said, I'll come and see her. So he came and she was crying. And he said, she wouldn't listen to anybody else. But when great master spoke, baby, what's wrong with you? She said, I am in hell. He said, how did you go to hell? He said, out of curiosity. In my meditation, I said, let me go and see hell. And Master, I did it on my own. I did not even ask you for it. Please forgive me. He said, is anybody hurting you? What are you saying? And she described the torture that was going on to people who were in hell, which was making her cry. And great Master said, is anybody hurting you? She said, no. He said, why are you crying? He said, I am crying because I can't afford to see, I can't even see the suffering of the other people here in hell. So great master said, listen to my voice and come out. So she came out and put her head on great master's feet and begged pardon for this journey. Then great master addressed us who were sitting around. He said, sometimes curiosity can really be dangerous in meditation. First of all, when you reach inside, Try to go towards the very manifested form of the master before you make any trips to the astral region or the regions. Master is waiting inside for you. Go with the master. Then say, Master, you show me whatever you want. See whatever you like inside with the master, not on your own. I, I am pointing out that there are heavens and hells in the astral plane. Don't go alone to visit them especially the hells. 
good people who done excellent good they'll go to heaven and enjoy their time and then come back when the time is over evil people will go to hell and spend time there how do we come to a physical form in the planet earth here with a combination of karma good and bad that is how physical life is created with a combination of karma which is high and low good and bad and that is why we all have good times and bad times we are here one has to accept these if you don't want to accept ups and downs then you won't be here so that is why it's just a natural thing that you are here hey an american disciple a great master you might have heard his name dr julian johnson julian johnson when he first came to the great master he was very impressed with the great master's powers and his great mercy and compassion for everybody so he would bring up cases of his friends in the united states master in kentucky i have a friend his wife is suffering so much can you help the great master would say yes i will pray to baba ji baba jamal singh his master to help your friend so he would ask for these kind of interventions over and over again then one after he had stayed in the dera for some time because i could speak english i used to go to a english speaking school so he used to take me along for walks we used to go to the river for walks almost every day when i was in the dera and one day he tells me on the way what a mistake i have been making trying to get intervention of great master in the karma of people i should have realized the ups and downs of karma are the platter given to us as a gift that is what is giving us human life and human life is necessary for us to be able to go to a true home and he said never again am i going to ask for any intervention it's a good thing that we have high and low good and bad so this is something very significant on the spiritual path to understand we are human beings because of this combination of our karmic pattern and that is why i am always saying don't worry be brave go through the low karma with as much cheerfulness as you can what masters do is if they find that the karma is unbearable or difficult they will intervene to make it light they will make it a big thing they can make it a small thing but the events still take place the events take place and you you go through it you knew you know at that time how bad it could be but for what you get past the intervention that you could pass through it so easily so that is why head masters do help perfectly with masters help but they help us to cope up with situations so one should not feel that we are getting no help because we are going through some low period or we are going through some sad events or something they happen they happen as part of our life everybody's life so keeping this in mind remember these events will come and go your meditation should not be affected by these we should not say i stop meditation because master did not help me in this situation he is helping he is helping for you to cope up more easily to bear these things more easily and that is why this <clears throat> is said that to live in his will is to surrender to his will they talk a lot of surrender so what is surrender surrender is when you say master i will accept what is your will and i am living according to your will now after that you can't then make a judgment on what's happening you left to to his will then live your life the best you can with all the strength you can have great master used to say you have to be a warrior to be on this path because you have to fight negativity you have to fight difficult circumstances therefore you have to be very brave to be on this spiritual path it's not a path for cowards he used to say it's a path for brave people so i am mentioning these things to make it clear that do not worry so much about the ups and downs of life meditation can continue at all times sometimes we notice that people meditate more when they are in the bad times good time they forget no no meditation good times also as much as the bad times 
Keep meditation a regular part of your life. Make a life, spiritual life. And then meditation works. So these three things which I mentioned yesterday, at the level of the wakeful human being, they are accomplished one after the other. Seating yourself at the third eye center. Then when you are comfortable and sure you are seating there. Because if you are not seated comfortably there, you slip out very often into the body awareness that you are sitting on a chair. You say, I am sitting here. And if you are not careful, not established for daily on that, you suddenly feel you are still sitting on the chair. This ability to be able to pull your attention up to the head has to be like you lifted yourself up to the head and you are now there and not on the chair. The body is in the chair, you are lifted up. I had a lot of problem after initiation to do this. And I was doing meditation like most of my friends, just sitting on the body and then closing my eyes and repeating words. Nothing would happen. For years nothing happened. So I said, there's something wrong. Then great master emphasized this point that you have to first sit there before you start meditation. So I said, Master, very difficult. I have tried. I keep on sitting where I am sitting, on the floor. I, I can't find a floor here. He said, come, I'll help you. So he said, raise your finger like this. Raise it and take it up. I took it up. Can you see the finger? No. Do you know the finger is up? Yes. You can't see it, but you know you are there. Now imagine you are sitting up on your finger. Can you imagine? I said, that I can imagine. It's just pure imagination. Yes, I am there. I am there sitting. I can feel it. Okay, now bring the finger down slowly. Are you still there? Yes, I am still there. Come right close here. Are you still there? Yes. Jump in. I jumped in. They sat there very easily. So it was, of course, his grace that he did this little thing for me. But I realized that it is not something that you have to sit in the chair and then make an image of yourself. It's not that you make a little picture of yourself and say, I'm sitting there. Because then you are still, your whole attention is right here. You have to raise yourself and sit there. It needs practice. So don't be in a rush. Step one. Get comfortable that the moment you close your eyes, you are there. And by the way, when I say close your eyes, it's only for some time. Afterwards, you don't have to close your eyes and you can be there. You can do meditation with open eyes. So that is why it's important to be there. Once you are there, practice. Take time. No rush. When you repeat the Sibran, Repeat it all the time, day and night, as much as you can. And especially when you do meditation, listen attentively. Don't forget, it's the listening capacity you are going to develop more than anything else. Listening is the key. When you listen attentively, you'll also be able to listen to other sounds. So the capacity to listen puts your attention inside better. So you pull yourself by listening and then the sound start coming. Then you play with the sound and pick up the right ones. These are very mechanical, mental operations which we can do without effort very easily. They can pull us up. Astral plane is not far at all. It's very easy to reach. Every time we imagine things, we are imagining in the astral plane, but we don't realize it. Because bulk of our attention is here, we use little bit of attention to imagine things. But what you imagine here is what is coming from there. All power of imagination is coming from there. All ideas that people have, people invent new things, scientists come up, they do. All that is coming from the astral plane. All new ideas are coming from there. Because that's the world of ideas. Socrates and Plato, they were explaining how the world of ideas is more real than this world. The Greek philosophers explained that the world of ideas is more real but looks like unreal. It's just an idea. 
then the idea is more real because if the idea were not there, nothing would be here. Nothing would be here. There would be a creation here if there was no idea. So therefore, and, and uh, I think Plato gives a very good example of the reality of the world of ideas. He says, look at a simple thing, like a chair. What is a chair? It's a word, English word chair. There are many equivalents in other languages. What is a chair? When a baby is born and grows up, hears the word chair, and he is made to sit on a chair, the baby's chair is only that small little chair on which the baby is seated. No other chair is a chair. When he sees more chairs as he grows up, the meaning of the word chair expands. The larger number of chairs he sees, the meaning expands. They are all chairs. They are all different. But if we use one word for all of them. Plato explains that if there was no idea of a chair, we wouldn't have a chair at all. How did the idea come? He says, comes from concepts. Concepts come from causal plane. All concepts come from causal plane. All ideas come from astral plane. That is a big thing to remember. All concepts come from the causal plane. All ideas come from the astral plane. The concept creates the ideas and the ideas create the physical universe. So when you say you are sitting on the floor, everybody you sit on the floor in this whole world. There was no chair. So the concept that one could sit higher than this also is possible. That you can be higher than the ground. Maybe. And the idea came in the astral plane. Yes, we can de design something that is higher. So the idea of a chair was born. When a chair was created, it is one idea of one chair that's created all the chairs of the world. Therefore, he says, except for that one chair in the world of ideas, there would be no chair anywhere. Everything that you see here is created the same way. It's all from the origin of a concept created in the causal plane, brought, brought up as ideas in the astral plane and made physical, visible in the physical plane. So that is why it's important that when we have some ideas coming, we think they are just mental thoughts. They are real. The whole world is created from that reality. Similarly, imagination, ideas, all these are coming from astral plane. And we, because we take this physical reality to be the only reality, we make it unreal. We call it unreal. When you will be at that level, you will find the ideas are more real than the physical world. And whatever you imagine there will become a reality. Whatever you imagine can become a reality in the astral plane. So it is not something set up like this. We have great powers of imagination. But the imagination extends to even knowing more through imagining than we have the power in the physical plane. For example, you imagine that your future becomes your future. Right? So it's very different from here. So when we experience that, we have to get used to that. There used to be a Mastana, intoxicated guy. He was from Balochistan and he had come to the Dera, became a great disciple, a great master. And he was a tall guy and uh, I became a little friendly with him. Because in Seva, we used to carry bricks. We used to go together to carry bricks. So I used to carry one brick on my head. He used to carry a whole basket of bricks. That is the contribution we two made to the current building sitting at Sapsangar in the Dera. It's a good opportunity to Seva like that. On the way, we would talk about our experiences. And he used to share his experiences. He said, I could never believe that we have to relearn our our stay and learn even our language learn how to use language in the astral plane that when i draw my attention there he said 
I have to relearn so much because we have been away for so long from that experience. It's almost like re relearning there. So these are experiences that you should go into slowly and enjoy, relax. There is no rush. When you have waited millions of years, what's the rush in getting in a couple of lifetimes even? Of course, I always like you to go in the same lifetime in which you get initiated. That's the best. But if you have to wait a little bit, we waited very long for this. Have patience. Don't be in a hurry. Now these practices, the pull of the sound can take you to the causal plane. Meditation by closing your inner eyes of the astral self can open up the causal plane. How will you recognize it? If you are not being guided by a perfect living master, right from the beginning, don't try to jump ahead of him. Go with the master everywhere. If you do meditation and you are on your own, you will recognize by the simple term change in the sound. The most important change will be <clears throat> in the atmosphere, the color of the sky. We have a physical sky here. Space is created with sky. When we say we have space here, space and time is sky that we can see there's a lot of space. Sitting inside a room, we don't know how big it is. When we go out in the open, we see the whole sky. That we say is a big space. The sky in the physical plane is colored and lighted by the sun. And the earth, when it moves, we get darkness and light. We get darkness at night, light in the day. This is a dual kind of uh, lighting of a sky. It's not always lit up. It's lit up half the time and dark half the time. This is the nature of the physical universe, that the duality is being expressed, even looking at what is a natural thing like a sky, dark now light. So this duality ends in the astral plane. This particular duality of the sky ends. And there it is always like a twilight time. Like we have late afternoon when it's light but not too, too strong, that is the color of the sky. 24-7 all the time in the astral plane. So there is no darkness as such in the astral plane. But there is not very bright and dark, not that, that great variation also. So you will know because everything that will happen in the astral plane will be in that sky, in that atmosphere. When you go to the causal plane, the sky becomes very bright. Very bright. Brighter than you've seen here. But the color will be Color of the sky will be like an orange color, like a golden color. If you have seen a setting sun, when the sun is just setting, when you can see it clearly, otherwise when it's too hot, when you can't see, when it's setting half set, look at the color of the setting sun. If the, that setting sun is stressed all over the sky, that's the causal sky. And sometimes, in the middle of your meditation sessions now, I got more reports about many of you having wonderful experiences in yesterday sessions. You may have glimpses of that sky and that's just a glimpse of the causal plane. The sky changes and, the, and you can't describe the, the sky after that because it's totally different, indescribable because it is not in space at all. The sky in the, after that, the way we are as souls living is totally different and I have no words to describe. If I could, I'll make a story. I just tell stories. People have told stories earlier also. Even mystics have told stories about that, which is not describable because it's outside of our understanding at this time. So the skies will tell us where we are. But my recommendation is if you are initiated by a perfect living master, you wait to meet the master in the astral plane. You can have some experiences in the astral plane, like flying in the sky. You can fly any way you like, or your own. You can see distant places, but 
when you go higher and up in flying, very often people have experiences of having seeing crossing even the moon and the sun and stars. When you are going that high, you will see <laughs> the radiant form of your master who initiated you in the same form as you saw in the physical world. Then the form can change. Your form can change. Master's form can change. But you will always know that's the same master. It will be automatic that you will know it's the master. Even both the forms are changed because form will change many times. The reason for that is that this form we have is a very short term one life form. We have lived through several forms, even as human beings. All those forms are collectively there in the astral plane. And you can from time to time see different forms of yourself. Many of you saw your old forms in the mirrors. You have written to me now. Last night I was reading some reports from many of you what you saw in the mirror during meditation yesterday. So, but you, the original form will be exactly the same as you see in the physical plane. If you do that, first it will look like you can see the master, then it disappears. Sometimes it looks like you come very close to the master and then you see that he receded, gone. Master is not moving anywhere, our attention is not fixed yet. It's game of attention. If you can place your attention on the, on the form of the master, we call it radiant form because visible in dark. So the radiant form of the master is not very different from the form you have seen outside. So when you see that form, try to be patient. Try to be patient in that form. And use something that I am going to talk about now. The most important part of the spiritual practice I am going to talk about now. Look at that form with love and devotion. The many, any way you can express your love and devotion, express it. The form will stay with you. The attention will be pulled to the form faster with your love and devotion than any other means. To tell you the truth, this is a path of love and devotion. The rest is mechanical, the rest is mental. Spiritual thing is love and devotion. Causal plane you will cross with the master. Best is to go with the master. There is no way, no meditation that you can do to cross the causal plane. I have met so many saints, mystics, yogis, swamis in my life. Deliberately go on to see what they teach. Their teaching is all confined to the causal plane. But they call it true home, call it the ultimate realization because all things that we see here are created from there. To that extent they are right. That's the great power. Our universal mind there at the causal plane is creating everything including our individual minds. But that is not the spiritual place which is our true home. Because true home cannot be achieved by any effort of ours. All effort is mental here and we reach the causal plane. To go beyond that as I mentioned, a hint gave yesterday requires someone to pull us from the beyond. The path of love and devotion alone that takes us beyond the mind. Neither Simran will take us, nor astral Jnan will take us, nor anything that we are doing here is only confined to these three worlds. To go beyond, Master pulls us. He starts pulling us even when we are here. We can't see it. He wants us to complete our journey in this very life. He doesn't want to postpone. We are distracted. Too many attachments, too many desires of things outside. Therefore, we delay our own journey. Masters, masters are keen that you go beyond the mind as fast as you can. Then you can take rest. Once you have discovered who you are, then you can relax. We do not discover ourselves as a soul till we have crossed the mind. And to cross the mind, only love and devotion counts, nothing else. Now, if it is true, some people sometimes ask me, 
if you have intense love and devotion for the master, is meditation necessary? My answer is no. If you can have that unfailing faith, love and devotion for the master, that never wavers, it's unshakable, meditation becomes redundant. Because that is what you will take you there. Meditation is just a means, a small means. Great master even said meditation is not capable of taking us anywhere. He said meditation, great master's words, is like a thermometer. We use thermometers to measure our temperature in fever, whether we have fever or not. Thermometer does not create the fever. It only measures it. He said love and devotion creates our progress. Meditation measures it. How much we have done. That's the importance of love and devotion. This whole path is based upon love and devotion. If you want to go to your true home, beyond the mind. Other things are, I have been mentioning, great experiences you can have. Good, they are good also. But they don't take you over the cycle of birth even. You spend long time there. You can spend long time. It's all time. In all the three regions, you are bound by time. Suppose you say, oh, I have done very good work, I want to go to heaven. Okay, you go for a thousand years, then what? You would come back exactly in the same situation here. In Indian mythology, Indian Hindus worship Lord Krishna, Avatar or Vishnu, the god of sustenance. And if you hear Krishna stories, you are amazed. Krishna, when he was young, he was a cowherd. He used to take the village cows out to graze. Ordinary life. People sometimes totally misrepresent what he was. Ordinary guy in a village. I've been to his village, where he was born, where he lived, the whole area. He was ordinary guy taking cows. He was enlightened. He was enlightened at a young age. So he could talk about things which normal people could not talk about. He had a very good friend of his. His name was Udo. Krishna and Udo were good friends. And they would go out together. Krishna was a little older than Udo. One day, this is the story, the recorded story, I am just repeating. One day, Krishna was going and he saw an ant crawling on the ground. And he looked at the ant little ant and he told Udo, Udo, we cannot understand the nature of karma, what karma can do. He said, look at this ant. This ant was once Brahma, the creator of this universe on the causal plane. He created the universe and he was Brahma because of his good karma of the past, became Brahma. When the time was up, today is an ant by previous karma being before that. It's endless. A creator from the causal plane who the whole world worships now became an ant. How is it possible? Well, that's how the karma works. It is relentless. There is no atonement in karma. People think we can get atonement. That we can wipe out karma by some means. Karma is never wiped out. Karma for millions of years continues to stay with us. So long as the mind is there, the same mind holds the entire karma, creates life after life. And if it is only human life, one would be happy with this. We can get little improvement in human life. No, you can go through the whole cycle of other life forms, including higher life forms, including life forms of the rulers of these higher universes, rulers who created the universes. You can get those forms and still come back. It's not a real liberation. The only liberation from the whole system is if you can go beyond your mind, beyond the universal mind, and discover the soul is not subject to any of this. Soul is not subject to any of this stuff. We just provide, soul provides life to the mind, provides life to the astral self, provides life to the physical body makes all of them alive so that they can experience. Soul makes all things into awareness and consciousness. 
It is actually consciousness that creates all this. So that is why there is no real salvation, like we say. There is no real liberation from this cycle of death and birth, birth and death. This is, this they have emphasized in many scriptures, they emphasize the biggest trap is you can't get out of birth and death, birth and death in different forms. And that's because of the capture, being captured by time here. So that is why these perfect living masters have come to pick up marked souls. They have not come to disturb the whole world. They have not come to disturb a creation. They are part of the creator. They have not come to destroy their own creation. They are not against the creation. They are for the creation. They like the creation. They want the souls to experience the creation. But souls that get tired of this creation, they have made a way out that they can go back home beyond the mind. As it happens, the negative entity wants to assert itself, running these three universes. Therefore, the negative entity wants to stop every soul that is going out and creates as many hurdles as possible. And we go through them. Some people say, after initiation, I have more difficulties in my life than I had before. And I say, great blessing. They don't like that answer. <laughs> I said, it's an acceleration of your karma. That's what you would have done in three lives is being done in one. Aren't you happy to go? But we don't see that where we are trapped. We have been trapped so long. So that is why these perfect living masters, when they come, they come to pick up souls who are ready to go beyond the mind. Most of us are not ready to go beyond the mind because we are wanting things to be done here. Master, please improve my health. I have a problem. Master, my son is not studying properly. Please give some grace. Master, I have no money. Can I win that lottery next time? <laughs> Master, can I get something better here? We all are requests of things right here. And some people who are spiritually minded, they master, they like to go to heaven, master, they like to go away from here and still play in. Some are even going to the origin. Let's go to the origin of the universe. People are worshipping gods and goddesses in, in Indian Hindu religion and they have given different roles to them. And the very nature of time is expressed by the gods. The three essential gods they call Brahma, Vishnu and Shiva and nothing more than beginning, middle and end. Everything in, in these three worlds has a beginning, middle and end. Everything, without exception. Except the soul which is beyond the, these three worlds. The soul alone exists beyond these three worlds. And that is why we have a problem here. Love and devotion for a perfect living master who initiates us is the way out. So many of you are initiated by perfect living masters. I'm so happy to sit amongst you. So happy to share this with you. Because you are marked to go back home. All we are doing is to satisfy our mind. Oh, we can also do something. Okay, you do a little bit. So little, tiny. And the rest is done by master. We have very little power. We don't even know how to express love and devotion. We try to learn simple things like that. How can one be devoted? When we use two words, love and devotion, obviously, there is two things happening. Yes, love pulls us and we become devoted automatically. That's why the two words are used. Devotion is a response to love. We have very mixed feelings about love. But the love of a perfect living master is so pure, great unconditional. When that pulls, we become devotees with devotion. That is why love and devotion go together. If we can express our love in any way we can, just as a response to our devotion, it's good enough for us. If we can start our meditation from the very first step, the three steps I mentioned, if we can start these three steps from the very first step with love and devotion, what a big head start it is. That is why 
I now recommend to you that meditation to be really successful to take us beyond the mind, you start with love and devotion. Therefore, I gave a very small, simple experiment yesterday to imagine that your master has come inside sitting in front of you. Many of you liked it. Today, let us have an experience that your whole experience of gathering yourself at the head is in the company of your master. When you fly, fly with the master. Use imagination at the time being till you find that you can really fly the master. When you do that, you will find that your love and devotion will grow automatically in the company of the master. So if you are all ready, close your eyes. Go back, remember the three steps. All steps being taken with the thought of the master, with master present and with love and devotion. That's the key. Close your eyes, go to the third eye center, center of your meditation chamber. Talk to your master. Have conversation. Interrupt your Simran, your repetition for a conversation and then go back to Simran again. Enjoy the company of your master at the third eye center with your astral self, not with the physical body. Fly in the sky with the master.
enjoy the music inside yourself. Enjoy the music of the sounds. Keep your eyes closed till I count five. One, two, three, four, five. Open your eyes. Welcome back. How many of you enjoyed this meditation session? How many of you felt that I should not have counted five, you could have continued? <laughs> very, very good. Meditation should be enjoyed, not made into a chore. Oh, I can't sit that long. If you meditate in love and devotion and manifest the Master, you will always enjoy it. You would like to meditate more, not less. You will be in a state of meditation automatically. That's how it should be done. Love and devotion for the master. Essential part of meditation all the time. From beginning to the end. It's very interesting that when we are trying to meditate with our own effort, it's very difficult to stay in. Distractions are very strong. When we are meditating with love and devotion for the master, you will notice the distractions are much less. Just the thought in our head of meditating with love and devotion changes the meditation. It makes it easier than when we struggle with it. Don't make meditation a struggle. Meditation is a great visitation with your master and in a different area, in exploring different areas. How many of you could fly with the master? Very good. Was it a great flight? I have always enjoyed my flights with the master. I think it's a great experience. It's amazing how much experience we can have. Now we meditate with these five words which have been given by some masters, the mantra. I said the mechanical use of those words is to replace the words of thought. That's just the mechanical part. But there's a bigger part. That when we are initiated by a perfect way master, whatever words he gives us to repeat, he empowers them. He puts his power into those words. And what is empowerment? Empowerment means if you are repeating those words mentally or even with your tongue, negativity will keep away from you. That's a big thing. We are living in a world surrounded by negativity and here we can repeat words and keep negativity away. So that is why use these words also when you encounter a negative situation and it disappears. Some people say that we are attacked by negative entities Use words, negative energy, run away from these words given by a perfect living master. That's another very big use. When you are flying with a master, if sometime a negative entity wants to appear as your master, if you are using those words, it will be your master and not a negative entity. 
There's a big safeguard. So many people ask me, how am I sure what I'm seeing is real or is just made up my mind? Repeat the words. If while you are repeating the words, what you are seeing, including the master, is real. It is the master. This is a big safeguard. Given by empowerment of the words, master gives us a big way to be safe about it. So that is why, now supposing we were to do only meditation with love and devotion, it will be enough. With faith. Now faith is also important. What is faith? Where does faith come from? Does faith come from experience? Some people tell me, if I see something, I'll have faith. That's not called faith. That's called seeing. That's called experience. Faith is to faith, have faith in something that we haven't seen. When we have faith in something we haven't seen with our eyes, that's faith. It can be completely a blind faith. We are believing somebody telling us something and we have blind faith. Is there a difference between blind faith and faith that is not blind, which I call living faith? Yes, there is a difference. Faith comes from partial experience. Like if I were to walk five steps and I am told there is a sixth, seventh step. Because I walked five, I can have faith there will be fifth and sixth. It's part experience and the experience generating faith in what I've experienced can extend further. This is living faith. As you grow in faith, the faith grows with you, or like all living things. Blind faith never grows. Somebody has said, God is sitting there, we believe it, it's blind faith. If we experience something every day more and more, it's living faith. So that is why to get living faith, unshakable faith, we base it on experience, not on the faith, but what is prior to the faith, which leads to the next step. Then we have more faith. Then we reach the next step, more faith. It is much better to have a living faith based on partial experience, which leads to more experience. And not that we have blindly following somebody what he says. In this path, great master said, there is no scope for blind faith. In your spiritual life, no scope for blind faith. It's not a religion. Most religions are based on blind faith. This the scripture says, the book says, so and so says, believe it. Period. Does your own life correspond with that? No. There is blind faith. If you are having experiences in life that lead to that belief, then that is living faith. So, Always believe what you see. What you hear from anybody, including me, what you're hearing. Don't believe it. Have faith in what your experience is. If you have partial experience, yes, that rest can also come. So go step by step what you've actually experienced. Of course, if you already had experience, that's not faith. So the experience, faith is just beyond the experience you've just had. And that's how it grows. The old story of two little children <coughs> who went to the beach because on the beach there was a ice cream, ice cream vendor he used to bring good ice cream. So this is a story they tell in India that Indian rupees, they, the ice cream cost five rupees. So two young boys, one of them had five rupees in his pocket and he took his friend for ice cream, they would share the ice cream. On the way to the ice cream vendor, they see a holy man sitting on the sand, making sand homes, sand houses, beautiful sand houses, very impressive. So the boy with the five rupees in his pocket, he was so tempted to see those. He said, I like to buy one of the sand houses. So the, his friend said, we came for ice cream, not for sand. He said, but I like it. So he asked that holy man, can I buy one of these houses? And the holy man said, do you have the price to pay? He said, how much is the price? He said, five rupees. 
he said, then give five rupees, take it. So he gave his five rupees and he bought a plywood and took the sand home with him back home. His friend was so angry at him. He came for ice cream. You are carrying sand with you. What a bad deal it is. So the, this, the friend who was feeling so bad that I never had ice cream and the guy only spent his five rupees on sand at night had a dream. In the dream he felt he was flying in the sky. And he was surprised to see in the sky houses lit up with light. That they were almost made up of light. And he saw those houses looked like the houses very similar to what that holy man was making with the sand. He said, oh my God, he was making those small sand homes from heaven, which I can see up there. And as he flew along the houses, he saw one house exactly like the one which his friend bought. And he saw the name of his friend written outside the house. He said, he got a house in heaven for five rupees. <laughs> what a fool I was. And he woke up. And he woke up and he ran to his friend's house. He said, you got that house for five rupees. I'll give you ten rupees for it. Just give it to me. And he said, no, you don't have to uh, buy this house. You can go and buy for five rupees another house from the holy man on the, on the beach. So this friend ran to the holy man on the, who was still making houses. So he said, I want to buy a house. Holy man said, have you brought the price? He said, I have got five dollars, five rupees. He said, the price is five thousand rupees. He said, what happened? What kind of inflation is this? <laughs> Yesterday was five rupees, today is five thousand. Holy man said, no, it's not inflation. Your friend bought the house without seeing it. He bought it on faith. You come after seeing it. The price is always high. When you're just seeing things and buying, if you do it on faith, you get a big bargain. So this is just a little story about faith. That faith is something that helps us. And it is, we have to have some faith to move forward. Why would we take the first step if we have no experience and no faith? We take the very first step in anticipation this first step will work. If first step works, then faith develops, second can also work. If second fails, we go back to first. So that is why faith grows with our experiences. Meditation is a great way to have experiences inside and outside which builds our faith. That's according to me, that's the main use of meditation to build our faith which increases automatically our love and devotion from the Master. Faith and love and devotion go together. If you have no faith, you cannot have love and devotion. The two, two go together. Only when you have faith in your Master, you get love and devotion automatically. If faith is lost, love and devotion also go by the wayside. So, meditation helps us in developing. Doesn't matter. How much we meditate? My own experience shows with all my friends who have been meditating for so many years that regular meditation helps a lot compared to sporadic meditation. If you meditate every day, it is far more valuable than meditating on weekends, for example. It appears to me that if you create a gap in your meditation, you almost start from square one every time. You go back to the same place and start all over again and have no further experience except what you had day one. But if you meditate every day, you can see some progress ahead. Progress may be slow, but it is there. Then, if you meditate regularly, your mind is set up in a certain way that you are able to observe more miracles of Master during the day during that day. You meditate in the morning, during the day things will happen which will remind you of Master again and again. Sometimes I call them coincidences. Coincidences are not accidents. Coincidences are a way of expressing an experience outside based on the experience inside. 
intuition sometimes give you knowledge insight you so intuitively you feel something there is no reason for it but you feel it and you don't know can i be sure about it these questions come in our mind i have an intuitive feeling this is going to happen can i be sure about it you drive your car there's a big ad put up on a hoarding outside using a few words corresponding to your inner intuition an outer symbol confirming your inner intuition if you begin to be observant of these things you will see every day what you are feeling and knowing inside is being repeated in little little events outside and confirming you get confirmation outside because the spiritual experiences are not merely confined to what you can see in meditation they are equally confined equally available outside they are equally available outside our life changes outside we feel very strong love for people we feel very close to people we feel the souls we feel their souls we feel they are all the same people coming from the same place they are all souls the whole attitude changes and hatred is replaced gradually by love for the very people you were hating you fall in love with those people there is a very big change that takes place by meditation inside and this effect outside so when people sometimes ask how will we know we are making progress or not i said you can see the progress inside and outside both is not near necessarily if you meditate regularly you will notice some things if you are very angry person you will get less angry your level of anger will drop you won't find it necessary to shout or yell or anybody because you will say what the use of it the attitude towards anger towards lust towards greed towards possessiveness all change they change gradually and the anger is attacked first then lust is attacked then possessiveness greed last to be attacked is your own ego pride claiming that i know everything i do this thing that becomes low you observe these other people start observing it in you so there are progress can be measured both with what is happening inside in meditation and outside let us have one more wonderful session of meditation with love and devotion close your eyes sit and have a nice party tea party with your master and have a chat with your master interrupting the chat with your simran from time to time that keeps the negative entity away all the time use your repetition and chat with the master have a nice chat and a nice a nice tea together or coffee if you like coffee depending on what your master likes and you might know the taste have a little good time with the master inside at the third eye center not physically outside discuss your problems with the master tell him what you feel what the problems are see his response they repeat the simran
Keep your eyes closed till I count five. One, two, three, four, five. Open your eyes. Welcome back. How many of you enjoyed this session of meditation? Very good. Very good. See, meditation is being becoming more enjoyable, that's a good sign. You should always enjoy your meditation. Always pull for, I want to meditate. I wish I get a little more time. It, the more you enjoy meditation, the more the pull for more meditation will increase. It's, a, it's not something to be considered a chore or I have to do two and a half hours. I promised to do two and a half hours. I can't do it. I'm feeling so guilty. Not that way. As I said, if you do regular meditation, even short periods. Your while life is busy, we have obligations, karmic obligations, just like you start with five minutes in the morning, five minutes at night, and then extend the time if you can. It's good enough if it is regular every day. It is better to do five minutes a day than two and a half hours every weekend. That's my experience. Keep the momentum, continuity of it all the time. So, start the morning with your master, five minutes. End the day with the master before sleeping. Master will be with you 24 7. It's that simple. So, master is going to take you to your true home, not your mind, not your thoughts, not your effort. Remember this, it's Master's grace that plays. What is the role of effort and grace? I can tell you. In the beginning, 100% effort. At the end, 100% grace, zero effort. And how does this take place? You gradually see that your effort is not useful. Your effort is futile. It's not even working the way you thought it will. Then, Grace is coming because experiences are coming. Ultimately, when you discover 100% grace, then you look back. Even the effort was part of the grace. You would not even make the effort if the grace was not there. The whole game of meditation going to a true home is a game of grace of a perfect living master who has come to take us home. He has come to take us home no matter what. We have marked souls for whom he has come. He will take us back. It's only for the little time that we are on our way back home that we have all these questions, and all these efforts, all these things that we are doing. Well, enjoy even that. Enjoy your little efforts. Enjoy 
how the so puny those efforts will look later on you yourself realize is all grace of the master if you want to pray for something prayer is for asking for something pray for more grace some people pray master uh, grant us more power to do more meditation i have never done that very dangerous you get caught up in their intellectual meditation all the time why ask for it i can do more i can you spend hours then more frustration comes why is it not working therefore when you have a chance to pray pray for more grace more grace more grace and you get everything including meditation including with effortless meditation this is truly an effortless path if somebody else pulls me how can i say i make an effort if somebody else has come to take me home and carries me home how can i say it was my effort when a little baby a little child is carried by the mother does the baby say i am making an effort to be carried by my mother <laughs> masters carry us like that like a mother carrying a baby the master carries us to our true home when we are about to it's as simple as that <coughs> therefore ask for grace ask for more grace and ask for more more time with master in meditation in thought in walking around every time seeing master around you he is always around you if he is initiated by a perfect knowing master it may he is not visible because your eyes are only tied with the what is visible if you start seeing invisible things which are astral things you see master with you all the time so this is a great path i'll take a break now and see you again about 3 o'clock